In life, we're faced with many choices every day. We get up and we make a choice. What are we going to wear today? What are we going to eat for breakfast? What will maybe we eat for lunch? What, what time are we going to wake up in the morning? What time do we go to bed? Will we read a book today? Will we, will we study God's Word? Will we go to town? Will we mow the grass? <clears throat> will we clean the house? Just to name a few. Now, we might have good habits that we stick to in order to accomplish our goals, or we may make choices based on the constraints of, of the moment. But we all make many choices every day. Among our daily routine decisions, we also make many important decisions as we go through life. For instance, we may decide to obey the gospel and to be baptized into the church. Maybe we decide to get married. Uh, we might decide to, uh, maybe we'll decide where we're going to live. Where, will we buy a house? What decisions will we make in raising our kids? Maybe what decisions will we make concerning our health? Some decisions are easy, and some are not so easy. Some, some decisions we make in life are, are difficult. Well, this morning, we want to take a look at a very important decision in the life of a Christian, and that is the decision to remain loyal to Christ. Our objective this morning is to look and to understand how necessary it is to be loyal to Christ, to remember how important it is to be loyal to God and to obey His command. Looking back through time, we find that it's, it's not always been easy for God's people um, to stay loyal to Him. Generally speaking, um, it's, not, it's, it's not been something that God's people, unfortunately, you know, done for a length of time. Um, it was always easy for them to drift away from God, but it's seemingly hard for them to stay loyal to Him all through the years. You know, it's because that, that man has a flesh. And, and we, all, we all have, uh, we're in, in that constant war with our own flesh. We're human. Mark 14, 38 says, Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh is weak. So there's something that's in, involved on our part when it comes to loving God. If, if we want to love God uh, properly, we must overcome the flesh. And it takes effort on our part to do this. It takes effort for us to obey God. It takes no effort, though, to sin. It takes no effort to, to do wrong and to be disloyal to God. So all of humanity has that choice, whether or not to obey the will of God. We may make, we may make the choice to be disloyal to God, to disobey Him. But in reality, we can, we can make that choice, but we don't have that right, you see. We don't have the right to be disloyal to God. As Christians, we are His. We were created for His pleasure. We are God's. But if we're not careful, we can come to the place where we start forgetting Him. We start forgetting whose we are. And this was definitely true of Israel there in Jeremiah's day. And that's what we want to kind of look at for the basis of our thoughts this morning. Look here at the place that Israel had come to. They had come to this place um, there in, in their relationship to God that it was not, it was not a good place to be. And so we want to look at that. And, and kind of look at where they went wrong and then apply it to ourselves today and apply it to, to our relationship with Christ. Our text verse here in Jeremiah 2.32 says, Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. So God's people were forgetting Him. The one who had led them through so many trials, the one who had led them across great waters across the Red Sea. He had led them then across deserts. He had led them even out of bondage there in Egypt. God had provided food for them. He had provided water for this multitude. He had been the one who had been so good to them. But yet, what do we see happen when people forget God? Notice there Jeremiah 2 verse 13. It says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So when people forget, they forsake. And we see this here, it led them to create their own cisterns or 
what it means there is, is their own idols. So they, they headed down this path you know, that, that pleased the flesh. And this is the path when, when love for God is lost. This is the path that, that is taken. Jeremiah saw this. And he, he seeks here to put forth this great effort to try and win the people back to God. He tried to remind them of the holy bond that existed between them and God. Notice there Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14. It says, Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family and will bring you to Zion. Throughout God's Word, we see that He took the most precious human relationship, that of marriage, and He used it to illustrate the relationship that He has with His people. This is an awesome way to help us today to understand the relationship God has with us and that we should have with God. Look in there at our, at our title again and our text verse. It says, Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. So can a bride forget her attire? Can she forget that veil that she wore? Can she forget her wedding dress? You know, what a, what a wonderful and significant day in, in life is the day of marriage. A man and a woman, two hearts there melded together by the power of God. What a, what a beautiful thing. Thus is our relationship with God. Here in Jeremiah, he says, You are married to God, but you have departed from Him. Jeremiah 3.20 says, Surely as a wife treacherously departeth from her husband, so have ye dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, saith the Lord. So God, God tells His people, look how you've treated me. Look what you've done. This is not supposed to be an on-again, off-again relationship. You made a commitment to me. You are married to me. We have, we, have, we have a covenant together. It says, but just as an adulterous woman would leave her husband, you have gone a-whoring from me. So they were joined in a marriage covenant to God, but they had broken it. They had dealt treacherously with their Creator. Treacherously here means to deal deceitfully, to offend, to, to transgress, to be unfaithful. So this is how the children of Israel had treated God. The one who was so good to them and kind to them and faithful to them. How could this be? What, what, how did they get here? How could they, how could they forget God? Would a young woman forget her wedding dress, that beautiful attire that she picked out and adorned herself in to make herself comely on that special day of her marriage? That would be very unlikely. See, a bride wouldn't forget her attire. It's one of the most sacred adornments on her wedding day. She, and perhaps you know, many would, would, would keep that dress in, in for years to come and maybe pass it on to their children or, or whatever, but... Maybe then just as something to look back on when her hair is gray and she's older in age and she looks back on that dress and remembers the happiness and pleasure of the day she adorned it. Israel here didn't even have the attachment to God that a bride would have to her wedding ornaments. Moses warned of this in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9 when he said, Only take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest thou depart from thy heart all the days of thy life, but teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. Israel here, they, they had seen so many wonderful acts of God. Deliverance from Egypt. Uh, he had brought them safely again through the sea, the Red Sea. He had given them manna and water daily. And he had given them water from a rock. But when the spies came back there from the land of promise, they got scared and, and they forgot what they had seen. They, they forgot their God. So those people, they had this tendency. And, and God knew it. And Moses, he had seen it firsthand. So it seems they were reminded repeatedly, don't forget God. Be careful not to forget. You know, maybe this, this started out as what we would call just being careless. Careless forgetfulness. Um, you know, we might get distracted. Today, we get busy, we get inattentive to God, we forget what He's done for us, and we don't pay attention to Him 
like we should. There's many things in this life that can cause us to be careless in our spiritual walk. But if careless forgetting, if it's left unchecked and we don't redirect our focus on God, another kind of forgetfulness will develop. And that's what we see here with the children of Israel, and that's, that's deliberate. They had become, come to a place where they deliberately forgot God. And this is, what, this is what had developed here with the children of Israel. They had forgotten Him. We'll look at some other verses that attribute to this. <coughs> Excuse me. Psalms chapter 106, verse 21 says, they forgot, their, they forgot God their Savior, which had done great things in Egypt. Jeremiah 13, 25 says, This is thy lot, the portion of thy measures from me, saith the Lord, because thou hast forgotten me and trusted in falsehood. <clears throat> Hosea chapter 8, turn over there. Hosea chapter 8, verse 14. It says, For Israel hath forgotten his Maker, and buildeth temples. And Judah hath multiplied fenced cities, but I will send fire upon his cities, and it shall devour the palaces thereof. <clears throat> so God, he had made them a people. He had preserved them. He had brought them out of bondage. He had, he had taken them, took them and made the children of Israel superior over other nations. How could they forget the one who had put them in this place? What caused them to forget their Creator? So we'll look at a few reasons here why they forgot God. And then compare their forgetfulness with the forgetfulness that you know, we can look around us and see in our day and age. Say, uh, first there, Jeremiah 2.30 says, In vain I have smitten your children, they receive no correction. So God here, He would correct them, the children of Israel, He would discipline them, yet they still would not obey. When God used the rod, it, it seemed to do them no good. He, he would smite them even. Yet they still would not adhere to His instruction. Notice there Jeremiah chapter 5. Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 2. Jeremiah 5 verses 2 and 3. It says, For, And though they say, The Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock, and they have refused to return. Wouldn't these people want to please God? Wouldn't they want to, to, to make Him happy? Wouldn't they want to seek out what, what He delighted in and do that? Psalms 51 verse 6 it says, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. So this is what God delights in. God delights in truth. He delights in people that, that obey Him. But here in Jeremiah 5.3, we're shown that truth didn't matter to these people. It was not found among them. Only those things that were evil. Only wickedness. And they were hardened in this. They were hardened in their wickedness. Jeremiah 5.3 says, They have not grieved. So, they were unconcerned with the sufferings God placed on them. He, 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 he chastised them time and time again. And, you know, maybe they were sorry. Maybe, maybe they hated it at the time. If, if you, know, uh, that these, you know, God brought chastisement upon them and it, maybe it made them sad, but it didn't cause them to repent. And again, we'll, we'll, we'll take notice that it wasn't just, some, just a little bit of scolding that God had done. He had consumed them, it says. So he had sent the Assyrians, he had sent the Moabites, the Ammonites, and he had sent many other pagan people to destroy them. They had been wasted. They had been wasted by their enemies, yet they made their face hard, and they refused to return. They just continued. They continued through all this to refuse God's counsel, defiantly persisting in their disobedience to God. It seems they laid aside all feelings and sense of judgment to the place there where God's correction did not affect them. As we said, they had become deliberate in their forgetfulness of God. And you know how surreal it seems um, that, that a people would come this far, but, but it happens. And we, we, we know that to be true by what we see today. We see it in our nation. We see it, uh, sadly, sometimes in the church when, when it departs from truth. 
Man is always going to reap what he sows, but often he doesn't learn his lesson. He doesn't learn from it, sadly. Israel, another thing they had done was rejected the prophets. These men that God had sent them, He had sent, sent these men to preach the truth to them, to help keep them on the right track. But 2 Chronicles 36.16 records, They mocked the messengers of God and despised His words. They misused His prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against His people and there was no remedy. So they perverted the truth that the prophets brought and they persecuted them. They mocked them. Jeremiah 2 and 30 says, Your sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. So they came to the place where they so hated the instruction of God that they killed the men of God who were sent to reprove them. And they, they set up false prophets, their own false prophets, in place there. Jeremiah 5.30, A wonderful and a horrible thing is committed in the land. The prophets prophesy falsely, and the priests bear rule by their means. And my people love to have it so. And what will ye do in the end thereof? Again, this was a people that was departed from God. Why? Well, here we see they had removed those that would tell them the truth. And they had set up men in place there who would tell them what they wanted to hear. This is not so far from many in our land today, is it? And this is what, this is what the flesh wants. The flesh wants, uh, doesn't want correction. All through ages of time, man wants to be left to his own. But when he's left to his own, he doesn't want to be reproved. He doesn't want to be told he's wrong. The Israelites love to have it to their own devices, it says. They love to have, they love to have these men that, that, would, that would lie to them, that would tell them the, the things they wanted to hear. Following God, you see, that would mean that they would have to restrain the flesh. They didn't want to do that. They wanted the kind of prophet described there in Micah 2.11. It says, If a man walking in a spirit and falsehood do lie, saying, I will prophesy unto thee of wine and of strong drink, says he even shall be the prophet of this people. So that, that man, that false prophet who promises things that sound so pleasing to the ear that you know he he tells he talks of only days of merriness and plenty and 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 no evil times this is what the children of Israel wanted to hear they wanted to, they wanted to hear these things that were pleasing to the flesh but what shall the end be <clears throat> Jeremiah 5:31 again what will ye do in the end thereof so the rejection of godly prophets and the instruction of of the false prophets it only brought them ruin it brought them it brought the children of Israel destruction they wanted to be their own masters they they didn't want to be bound they didn't want to be bound by God Jeremiah 2 again verse 31 says O generation see ye the word of the Lord have I been a wilderness unto Israel a land of darkness wherefore say my people we are lords I will come no more unto thee. We've broken loose from you, God. We don't need you anymore. We're our own. We're free to roam. The psalmist David said in Psalms 12 and 4, Who have said, With our tongue will we prevail? Our lips are our own. And who is Lord over us? So this described their actions. They acted as if no one was in charge over them anymore. Not even, not even the very Creator their heavenly Father. They just want, and and just as they wanted false prophets, they also wanted um, false false things to worship. And Israel created idols. They created things that were easy to obey, gods they could worship that would let them do as they pleased. Judges two and seventeen. Yet they would not hearken unto their judges, but went a whoring after other gods and bowed themselves unto them. They turned quickly out of the way which their fathers walked in obeying the commandments of the Lord, but they did not so. So they departed, and, and we're looking here at reasons, you know, things that they'd done that, that brought them to the place that, that, they, that they had come to. They departed from God because they went after these other gods. They went a-whoring after other gods. Again, they were married to God. They were married to, to the, the one true God, but they played the harlot unsatisfied 
and, and following the flesh, seeming to just forget their true love. The one who loved them. The one who had saved them and brought them out of the land of bondage. They rejected His Word. Jeremiah 7, 26 says, Yet they hearkened not unto Me, nor inclined their ear, but hardened their neck, and did worse than their fathers. So it had not improved here in Jeremiah's day. It says they were worse than their fathers at hearing God's Word and obeying. And sadly, we see this heart in the Israelite people for hundreds of years. Even there until until the time there in Acts, there Stephen, uh, he shamed them in Acts 7.51 before they stoned him. He told them, he said, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so did ye. He said, You may be circumcised Jews by name, but in heart, in hearing, in your actions, you're just like the world. So they rejected the Word of God and they had become just like uncircumcised heathens. All these, all of these many grievances against the Lord, all these things we've looked at, they've done. This, this caused Israel to be morally, basically morally bankrupt. They, they had no morals left. Jeremiah 6, verse 13. <clears throat> For from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall at the time that I came, that I, at the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. <clears throat> so, it was from the poor to the rich. It didn't matter their age, young, old. Their hearts were generally corrupt and void of morality. The commandments that were meant for their good and their protection, um, they had disobeyed they, to no end. So Israel had forgotten their wedding dress. They, they had forgotten that attire, that spiritual attire. They had forgotten it. And this was brought on by, by deliberately, persistently forgetting, forgetting their, their God. <clears throat> what about us today? We bring it, bring it to our times today. You know, it might be easy for us to look there um, back at the Israelites and say, look how terrible. Look, look how they forgot their, their Creator. Maybe we feel we're superior to them. More spiritual. Maybe, maybe we think that we could never go this far. That, that forsaking God and forgetting our wedding dress, could, this couldn't happen to us. We tell ourselves we could never forget God like they did back then. But brethren, it can happen. It, it can happen to us. And we must beware as we mentioned, and we talked some last night, we live in a time where there's so many distractions. There's so many worldly pursuits that can consume our time and cause us to put God on the back burner. Have we forgotten our tire? How's our relationship? How's our relationship with our God? Have we forgotten Him? Does He not hold the importance in our life that He once did? Does God and His Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, hold the position that they should. We need to take heed not to forget. Just as the children of Israel were warned, we need to be warned today not to, not to forget. Notice Romans chapter 7. <clears throat> Romans chapter 7 verse 1. It says, Know you not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, <clears throat> how, that man, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the, for the woman which hath a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from that law of her husband. So then if while her husband liveth, she be married to another, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also, notice verse 4, are, are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another even to Him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. As members of the body of Christ, we are married to Him. The old law has been done away with. That law um, of sin and death 
And now all mankind that has not obeyed the will of God has the ability to have their sins removed and to be joined to Christ. What a beautiful thing that this, that this is. In Jeremiah 3, verse 14. Again, turn, it says, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family and bring you to Zion. I am married to you. This is something God has always sought. He's always sought this kind of covenant relationship with His people. He reminded the children of Israel back then, they, they had a, com a commitment. They were married to God. And today, it's the same of us as members of the church. We are married to Christ. Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5 verse 22. It says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and He is the Savior of the body. The relationship that, he, that we have with Christ is a beautiful parallel of the husband and wife union. When the union is as it should be, the wife doesn't forget the husband, neither does the husband forget the wife. Christ does not forget us. Therefore, neither can we forget Him. We can't forget, we can't forget our attire. We put on Christ. We wear Him. We are, we are the bride of Christ. And we submit to Him like a wife submits to her husband. Christ loves His church. And we need to love Him. We do not love Him properly and cannot love Him properly if, if we run after other religions and, or if we run after the things of this world. That's, that's the Old Testament equivalent of what we looked at there. Is these, these, these people, the, the children of Israel went after other gods. They went a-whoring after other gods. You see, we can do that today if we run after other false religions or if we run after worldliness. So how can we today keep from this? How can we, and how can we keep from forgetting Christ? And I just, just there's a couple things uh, that, that I had, had put in my, in my study here. One thing, one thing I think maybe we, we fail to, to do sometimes is making um, that connection with baptism that we should. You know, maybe, maybe some of us remember some details about that day of our baptism, but perhaps some of us have forgotten what day it was. Perhaps maybe we've forgotten the date that we got baptized. But, you know, this is a good thing to remember. Um, the, day, the day every year, there when it rolls around, remembering that that day we were born again. And perhaps if, it, if it's something that, that we haven't done in the past, maybe just it, with our children, impressing, impressing upon our children as it, when they obey the gospel, r reminding them often of the importance of that day, the significance of remembering that covenant we agreed to with Christ. On the day of our baptism, we were joined to Christ in an eternal commitment now, I think this is one way we can ensure that we don't forget our spiritual wedding dress. You know, those of us who are married, uh, we know our, our wedding anniversary or is something we shouldn't forget. But maybe going forward, we strive to remember the day we were baptized. Remember our spiritual anniversary, the day that we were, the day we were joined to, to, to Christ and His, and His church. Another way we remember Christ is by something that that, of course, we, we already took part in this morning. And we're thankful for this. You see, because without this, it would be, it'd be very difficult to, to remember that commitment. And, and this is something that was set up for that very purpose. We meet around the table to remember the Lord's death and suffering. <clears throat> we remember the commitment that was made to us before the world began. 1 Peter 1.19 With the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So if we remember what Christ has done for us and the commitment that we made to Him upon our baptism, we go a long ways in not forgetting our spiritual attire. The communion of the body of Christ is not something for us to take lightly. We mentioned earlier you know, how that, that we can get careless. We can get distracted and busy and maybe we... We, we, we meet on the first day of the week and, and we can be inclined to participate in, 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 the, in the Lord's Supper just as a form of habit. We have to be careful not, not to get to that place. We need to stop and consider 
what's a communion means and, and, and what it means to us as Christians. We can't, we can't let ourselves neglect our wedding attire in this way. Paul admonished us in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till He comes. So may we often remember God and Christ in, 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 in the daily activities we partake in and, and remember that covenant we have with them. May we be mindful of, of our prayer life, asking the Lord to, to help us in this area. The children of Israel, they had forgotten the seriousness of God. And we, we have to strive not to fall snare to that weakness today. We need to be intentional. And, and it, basically that's what we've, we've been talking about this morning is, is that ensuring that we don't forget our spiritual attire. We, so we, we need to be intentional. You know that you can listen to to people talk about finances and and you know or marriage or raising children or whatever and you know you can listen to many uh, people talk about this and every one of them will usually have something to say along the lines of you're good at what you're intentional about you're good at what you pay attention to so we must be intentional we must pay attention to our commitment to God. What happens to us as Christians? What happens if we start down a path of forgetfulness? Maybe if we start down that path um, uh, forgetting our spiritual attire. Well, one of the things that can happen is we can forget how important the church is. We, we can simply forget um, how important the body of Christ is. Maybe we get to the place where worship's not as important to us. Uh, gospel meetings, they're, 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 they're less important. Our brothers and sisters, maybe they become less important to us. Our love for our love for one another as the body of Christ. Maybe we lose that desire for sound doctrine. Maybe it becomes less important. And we we tend, we bring things into the church or bring things into the pulpit that lead us down that lead us down liberal paths. In a marriage relationship, if the husband and wife start spending less and less time together, They'll grow apart. They, they will lose the connection they once had. They will lose that love and desire they once had for, for each other. This too can happen spiritually to us. If, if we neglect the body of Christ, if we, if we allow our commitment to Christ to grow weak, then our love for Christ and His church will grow cold. This is serious. This, this is very dangerous to our souls. And the scariest part is that this falling away is, is usually gradual. Whether it, it comes from you know, uh, us deliberately uh, forgetting or just getting, you know, getting careless to begin with. Um, maybe it, it's someone that we fall in company with that um, it, is leading us down the wrong path. The falling away is usually gradual. It's, it's usually very subtle. So we have to be on guard. We have to guard against this. The children of Israel started out there just careless. They just started out as carelessly forgetting their wedding attire, but eventually, you see, it will become deliberate. It will, it will turn into our deliberate forsaking of the Christian covenant. Once we start down that path of forsaking the covenant with Christ, the effects, they, they're going to snowball. They're, they're just going to continue to, to progress faster and faster. We may... Maybe we get to the place where we seek, start seeking to justify things and, and to justify uh, our sins instead of making them right with God. When we were married to Christ, we agreed to a set of laws. When, when, we, when we forget that, when we forget our wedding attire, we may seek to abandon His ways for our own will, just as the children of Israel did. We may, we may do things we know that are wrong, but we start searing our conscience by rationalizing our sin and by making it feel okay. And we see this today. And I believe this is where, sadly, a lot of people stray is they do things that feel right to them. They, 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 do think, they seek to do things that feel okay. They may make decisions based upon feelings. That's, that's something that all of us has, has to work on because that's, that's the flesh. But making decisions based upon feelings rather instead of based on decisions of truth or, or God's law. Jesus said there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. 
So seek the things of Christ first. Not our own flesh. Not, not our own feelings. We must guard our conscience from being hardened. Paul said in Acts 24, 16, Herein do I exercise myself. Do I have always a conscience? Or I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. What a powerful verse. A conscience void of offense. We need to, we need to strive to have a conscience that is, uh, that is working properly. Lastly, in our brief study, another problem may arise from forgetting our spiritual wedding uh, dress is that we go so far in our forgetfulness that we no longer benefit from God's correction. And that, that, that is, that's a sad place to find ourselves. Notice chapter, uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. It says, <coughs> excuse me, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our own flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? The Lord doesn't, he doesn't mince words. He doesn't mince words when, when, when telling us how important it is that we listen to Him. And that we, you know, if we love God, we'll receive His uh, correction. We'll receive His instruction with humbleness. And we understand His authority. But if we've forgotten Him, if, if, if we have forgotten Him, we don't forget or we don't profit from His correction. We ignore it because you know, His correction is no longer of any value to us. God used a strong language to convey to us in this passage. And after, you know, after we get maybe to the point um, where we throw, it, we throw His correction away, we find another thing happens found in Romans 1.28. It says, Even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. We can get to this place. God will give us over to a reprobate mind. In other words, He will reject us. If we come to the place where we refuse to retain God in our knowledge, He will reject us. And we can see the Israelites that came to this place. God had rejected them from being His people. And we see, we see where this mentality leads. We don't want to take steps in this direction. Therefore, we've got to heed. We have got to take heed that we guard against forgetting our wedding dress. We, we guard against forgetting our spiritual marriage to Christ. As we bring our marks to a close this morning, we can be so thankful that God has provided us with, with, with a way to be married to Christ. He's provided us with a wedding dress. Just that beautiful thought that, that those of us who have been baptized are married to Christ and those who, who may not be baptized yet, maybe they're not of age or, or, or whatever, they're going to have that opportunity in the future to put on their spiritual wedding dress and to be married to Christ through the, the blessed plan of salvation. The Lord spoke there in Hosea 2.19. He said, I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness. And thou shalt know the Lord. If anything, this, this should cause us to be both loyal to Christ and, and to remain loyal to Him and not forget the One who's brought us through so many trials in life. See, we have the hope as described there in Jeremiah 6, 16. Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein, and you shall find rest for yourselves. We have to seek the old ways. We have to seek the paths of truth. We want to be clothed 
in the attire of Christ, in the attire of truth. You know, just like being clothed um, in the cold in the winter time, being clothed and having a coat um, protects us from the elements, maybe the wind, the, the cold, the rain, the snow. Well, this is what our spiritual attire, our spiritual wedding dress marries us to one groom, and, and it protects us from the elements of the devil. If we wear our wedding dress faithfully, Christ will be as a faithful husband to us. He will care for us. Christ will provide for all our needs. The psalmist reaffirms in Psalms 37, 25, I have been young and now I'm old, yet, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. We are so blessed. We cannot forget, brothers and sisters, today to love the Lord, to love the church, to love Christ who's the head of the church, to love the members who make up the body of Christ, to love the law of God, to love truth. If we strive to remember these things, we cannot forget our spiritual attire. We cannot forget our spiritual wedding dress. Isaiah 61 verse 10, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God, for He hath clothed me with the garments of salvation he hath covered me with the robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom decketh himself with ornaments, and as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. That's our lesson this morning. Wouldn't want to close without first offering a song of invitation. Perhaps there's one who uh, has never become a member of the church and wants to take those steps that bring one into Christ. Or perhaps one is a member and feels like there's something in their life that's not exactly right. There's something that's brought them a guilty distance from God. Maybe one that just needs encouragement and, and, and the prayers of the church. If there's one in any condition, come as we stand and as we sing.